Welcome to NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California. I'm Veronica McGregor. We're here to give you another update on the Curiosity rover mission on Mars. Today is Sol number 51. That marks 51 days, more or less, that the rover has been exploring the red planet. Uh, if you were there right now where the rover is, it's about 6 o'clock in the evening local time, and it's late winter, just a couple of days away from the start of spring. Let me introduce the science panel that is going to bring you up to date on some of the recent exciting discoveries on Mars. We'll begin with uh, Dr. John Grotzinger. He's the project scientist for the mission. He's with the California Institute of Technology. Dr. Mike Malin with the Malin Space Science Systems in San Diego. Rebecca Williams, she's with the Planetary Science Institute in Tucson, Arizona. And Bill Dietrich with the University of California at Berkeley. And we're going to begin with John Grotzinger. Thanks, Veronica. So I'll just bring up to date a little bit on where the rover is. As Veronica said, it's the evening of Sol 51, and the science team is now planning Sol 52's activities. Um, it's been about three sols since we left the rock that we called Jake Mateevich, and that rock is the first place where we actually put out the arm and took images with the Molly camera and also the APXS instrument, which gives us chemical composition. And now we've driven quite a long way. Yesterday we had our longest drive of uh, uh, quite a bit over 50 meters, maybe 53, 54 meters, and we are most of the way now to Glen Elg. And what will happen now is that the science team is busy trying to choose a target to collect material, probably sand, probably windblown sand, that we will put into the chemical laboratories for the first time uh, on this mission into the SAM and the ChemMen instruments. And that's an activity that will take on the order of two to three weeks. So we're, we're choosing this target carefully so that we can do as much science as possible there. Okay, so as we were driving along on the way to Glen Elg, we encountered some really interesting outcrops that were surprising to the team. And in the first graphic, what you'll be able to see uh, are these uh, outcrops. And this is one of them. Uh, it's named Hada. And to us, it just looked like somebody came along the surface of Mars with a jackhammer and lifted up a sidewalk uh, that you might see in downtown LA uh, and sort of a construction site. So you can see this, this rock unit, and it's about uh, 10 to 15 centimeters thick. So it's sort of on that scale, and it's tilted in the perspective you're looking at. It's tilted off to the right. And what it does is it exposes the materials that, that make up this uh, slab of rock. And there's a couple of these, and what we're going to be presenting today, uh, my colleagues here will show you, what represents the consensus opinion of the science team that this is a rock that was formed in the presence of water. And we can characterize that water as being a vigorous flow on the surface of Mars. And, and we were really excited about this because this is one of the reasons that we were interested in coming to this landing site was because it presented from orbit uh, quite a strong case that we would find evidence for water on the ground. Turns out that, in fact, we landed on this unit and, uh, and this makes a great starting point for us to do uh, more sophisticated studies using the rover uh, payload. So what I'll do now is uh, turn it over to Mike. Thank you, John. Uh, I'm here sort of as the ghost of uh, briefings past. I'm going to show you how we had anticipated with the design of the cameras this type of outcrop and how uh, when I briefed uh, the uh, media uh, in, uh, at the launch briefing for science, on the uh, 23rd of November, I actually used as an example, this would be the type of rock the cameras would excel on. To remind you, the mass cameras, there are two of them. One is a 34 millimeter focal length, which is sort of a moderate wide angle, and then a 100 millimeter, uh, which a telephoto lens, gets about three times higher resolution. If I can have my first graphic, You'll see this is a slide from the November 23rd uh, presentation, which is a conglomerate bedrock outcrop in central Utah. It's about 100 million years old, and it's really a rock made out of a bunch of pieces of, of gravel. It's a rock made out of rock, 
and the the squares, the white squares, are enlarged at the bottom of this graphic. If you look at the one on the right, you can see there there are a few bands of light tone uh, intermixed with sort of a, a speckly texture. The speckly texture is the conglomerate, has lots of little pebbles in it. The lighter tone things are sandstone, so there was sand moving down a stream along with cobbles, and you'll see a little pebbles, you'll see that a little bit later in this presentation by Bill Dietrich. But this is the view that we get with the mass cam from a hundred meters, from a 50 meter distance. And the next, view, uh, next slide shows uh, if you got to 10 meters distance, what you see in either the 34 millimeter camera at the top or the 100 millimeter uh, camera at the bottom, you can see that the particles, the, the pebbles are about a centimeter or two centimeters across, and the bed of sand you can see is roughly the same, there are layers in the bed of sand, they're roughly the same thickness. Uh, these are water lane sediments that were then turned into a rock, and then that rock has been eroded away, showing us this large outcrop. Uh, the next uh, slide shows a, a feature on Mars. Uh, our first view of this similar type of rock came where the landing engines blew away the dirt and, uh, and unveiled this layer beneath the, the surface debris. And you can see in the upper left corner an enlargement of, that, of the white box that shows that there is a layer there that seems to have rocks embedded in it. We have a higher resolution view of that in the next slide, which was taken with the MassCam 100. And you can see in the lower left now that the gravelly surface and the gravel at the edge of this layer, this is a relatively thin outcrop of the materials you're gonna see in a few minutes. Uh, but basically we had anticipated and discussed both before the launch and right after landing that where we were going should have these water lane sediments that have been turned into rock. And Becky is going to talk a little bit more about the rocks themselves. So from the Bradbury landing site, we knew we were seeing a different type of material, one we really haven't seen on Mars before. And uh, we were hoping that as we proceeded to Glen Elg, we would see additional exposures of this type of material that we could investigate further, specifically with the MassCam 100. If I could have my first graphic, please. So this is the Hata exposure that John introduced you to a few moments ago. And we were just really extremely fortunate to have such an ideal viewing geometry of this material. This is a fractured rock outcrop that has been naturally tilted, and it's just an ideal viewing geometry for the MassCam 100 to look at the fine-scale textural properties of the rock. When a geologist goes into the field, what they want to do is see a fresh exposure of rock to look at things like the grain size, the shape, the color, and the arrangement of those grains, and that tells you a lot about the formation history of that rock. So with the MassCam 100, we're, we acquired these images on Sol 39, and I'm going to zoom in on the lower left-hand portion of the screen. What you see is this rock is made up of rounded gravels. There's one circled for you at upper right, and a matrix that's very sand-rich. And these attributes are consistent with a common sedimentary rock type called a conglomerate. Now the class that is circled is about three centimeters across. It's roughly the size of the gravel that I'm holding in my hand. And you'll see that the perimeter has a very rounded shape. It's been worn by abrasion in a sediment transport process. You'll also notice the gravel is sticking out from the rock. And over time, erosion is um, working on that rock face and liberating some of the gravels. And they're falling down and accumulating on a pile at the base of the outcrop. In the next slide. A second exposure of this very same material we saw on Sol 26 and imaged it with the MassCam 100, the narrow angle, on Sol 27. And this outcrop's name is Link. You see very similar textural properties that we saw at Hada. Again, very rounded gravels in a light-toned sandy matrix. And again, we have that gravel pile that's adjacent to the rock outcrop. So by looking at the size and shape distribution of the gravels that are not only in the rock outcrop, but those that we infer were liberated from the rock outcrop there on the surface, we can get a good idea of the range of, of gravel size and shape properties that you see there. In the next slide, we'll zoom in, and there's another one of these rounded gravels that's about one centimeter across, so it's roughly the size of a plain M&M. 
And geologists are interested in rounded gravels because they tell you that they, those particles have been subjected to a sediment transport process, either by water or wind. And so typically you start off with a very angular rock fragment, and as it's transported, it's bouncing along, interacting with other grains and the surface, and that wears away the edges until you have a very smooth surface, such as you see here in this pebble. And the key components of these gravels that we're seeing here are one, the rounded shape, but also the size. These are too large to be transported by wind. The consensus of the science team is that these are water transported gravels in a vigorous stream. On the right of the graphic, you can see a st typical stream bed deposit. It's a gravel conglomerate that has gravels of the same size and roughly the same roundness as we see on Mars. And so this is just wonderful ground truth confirmation of this uh, water transported material that was predicted based on analysis of orbital images. And now Bill will talk about the potential source of these gravels and uh, also further details of the water transport process. Thanks, Becky. So I'm going to ask the question, where do these gravels come from? And what was the environment like at the time of deposition of the deposits we now see at the rover site? And to do that, I'm going to use a term called fan, and specifically alluvial fan. And to explain that, I'm going to take you on an aerial tour, first uh, through Death Valley and then back to Gale, and connect the dots between the fan and the deposits we see. So if I could have the first video, I introduce you to an area you're familiar with. There's Los Angeles and there's Las Vegas, I-15 between. And we're going to take a flight just to the right of Zizix, um, and where there are six fans outlined in, by, in white that illustrate the form and process that I want to talk about. Um, so we'll zoom in, and you'll see the four that are facing us, the white lines delineating the lateral boundaries of sediment deposition that has occurred as a consequence of sediment and water rushing out of the canyons that are on the hills there. And we'll now go up to the headwaters, uh, and we see the stream, can the stream confined a canyon. And then it reaches the front of the mountain. And as water and sediment rushes out, it spills. And as it spills, it forms a sheet of water, or it, it runs out as discrete channels. And you can see them there, shifting right, shifting left. As it deposits, it elevates and shifts right, left, back and forth, building the fan structure that's so characteristic and so identifiable. We've rotated it across the, uh, this white tone fan, and now we're settling down and looking back. So now you see the fan shape, just like a fan you'd use to cool yourself on a hot day. You see the white outlines of the structure, um, and you see how it's, it's a result of water and sediment pouring out of a canyon. So if I could t now go to the next uh, video, we're going to go to Gale Crater. And we're flying from north to south, and you see in red lines the lateral boundaries of a fan, just like what we saw in Death Valley. And we're looking down at a canyon. Um, a canyon that is about 11 miles long, 2,000 feet wide, and about 100 feet deep. And that canyon was cut by stream flows, and that stream and sediment then entered the crater rim wall and spilled out um, left and right, and the blue lines delineate distinct channels that we can recognize, fossil beds if you like. Um, we look at these channels and we see th um, that they uh, cut uh, across the fan system, and to us, they suggest that this fan did not form in a single instance, but this records some duration of a process. Now, we find, we settle down, and there's Curiosity. It's about a two to four mile hike from the nearest channel to Curiosity, all downhill. So we think it's reasonable to suggest that the water and sediment came down that fan that we see now, the sediment at Curiosity. And looking back, you see a watershed. You see a canyon, you saw a fan, you see channels. Now, what was it like then if you were standing at exactly a Curiosity site at the time of uh, the sediment deposition? And the next video will show that. So here is water moving sand and gravel. It's a vigorous sediment transport process, bursts and sweeps of turbulence, mobilizing together sand and gravel. Uh, and, of course, the consequence of that motion is collision, breakage, and rounding of particles. Uh, and in a flow that we can estimate for the rover site that might have been from ankle to hip deep, 
and maybe moving a few feet a second. And we arrive now at what the, the bed of the rover site might have looked like after the last flow, of course visited by a few earthlings. Um, <laughs> Uh, that was the Atacama Desert. And you see the heterogeneous bed, you see the patches of sediment, and what we can think about then is that we were in a watershed. We saw um, going from an uplands to a lowlands, and we would start with a rock that would be big and broken like this, and it would travel something like 20 to 25 miles and end up something small and rounded like this. This, going from this to this, is direct visual evidence of the wear by what we call bed load transport, of the wear particle collision and the transport by water um, to the site of interest. So we can see from th these stones, as Becky has described, are very revealing to us about the process and even th the potential of connecting curiosity to the fan system we observed at the site. Okay, so uh, thanks, Bill. I'll just wrap up here and, and summarize some of the key uh, observations. Uh, that allow us to, to tell you about this story about water flowing on Mars. So, first of all, this represents a great collaboration between the Curiosity rover and the orbiters that are routinely mapping Mars. Now, in the case of the looking at the alluvial fan, uh, we, we see that that's provided by both the high-rise uh, imager, the CTX imager, uh, previous generations of imagers look at these features that geologists have long thought of as alluvial fans, but now that we're down on the ground with curiosity, we can see the textural evidence that Becky and Mike talked about, where you see the individual pebbles, the rounding, the, the geometric relationship that they have to each other that gives us a sense for that. So if we just go back one, please, uh, we should be able to see where these different uh, features occur on our route to, to Glen Elg. And so uh, Goldburn was the, was the outcrop that Mike talked about, the one that we got for free way back when, when the, the thrusters blew the soil away. And at that time, the team came up with a number of hypotheses to potentially account for this. And then uh, we had a lot of discussion about it, and then we worked our way to Link, where we were able to see the first of the outcrops uh, that, that Becky talked about. And we began to wonder about the stream flow option as being the most likely candidate. And it was really when we got to Hada where we saw this again most clearly uh, that it was, uh, it was very easy to reach team consensus to, to come with you, to, uh, to come to you and present this, this story about where we are. Now the rover is currently about uh, three quarters of the way between Hada and, and Glen Elg, and we're working our way down into that key area where these three terrain types come together. So if we can go to the next one, uh, again, just to remind you something that we showed you uh, uh, before we landed uh, in the press conference before then, we see the alluvial fan in Peace Vallis, which is now the, an official name uh, uh, that the IAU has uh, uh, approved. Uh, as the entry point for water into this feature, what we were uncertain of at the time of landing was whether or not this alluvial fan extended all the way down into the landing ellipse. And you see where we landed is, is quite a bit away from where you would identify, as, as Bill said, it'd be a, a few miles hike to get to the, to the base of the alluvial fan. So it looks like at least intermittently that, that fan extended down to where where the rover was. That's, that's our most uh, popular hypothesis right now for the team. The other part of the story that we talked about is in the last slide, uh, where you now see the map of this feature called thermal inertia. So we're beginning to get a sense of what that might mean now, because you see the X where Curiosity landed, and you see high values of thermal inertia, but not the highest values. So we wonder uh, what might cause this, this greater retention of heat, and it could be because you're dealing with materials that are consolidated. And what we haven't told you today is anything about the rest of the payload, what we might measure in terms of the chemistry, what we might measure in terms of the mineralogy. What we do know is we go down towards Glen Elg, we're going to go towards that red patch, which is where the thermal inertia becomes the highest. And so our plan as we go forward now is to study the chemical and mineralogical attributes of these rocks and see how water may relate to the cementation of these gravels to form a rock. And that, that's really where it brings us is to really the beginning of the science uh, mission 
where we have now discovered evidence for water, and what we'd like to do is to begin to characterize habitable environments. And that requires using all of our payload, including the instruments that measure the chemistry and the mineralogy. So we'll keep you updated as we go along with those uh, uh, measurements as well. Okay, we're going to open it up to questions. I'll start by asking if there's any here at JPL, and then we'll go to some of the folks on the phone line. So we'll begin right here, and just wait for a microphone to come to you and give us your name and affiliation. Thanks. Hi, uh, Mark Coughlin with the Washington Post and National Geographic. Uh, I, I wonder if you have any estimate for the length of time that the water might have been running, uh, or any estimate of when it might have been running. Uh, I have a follow-up question as well. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, th th we, at this point, you, you chose your wor words well, estimate. Um, we, we see clear evidence of multiple channels across the fan, and, uh, and we actually see a, quite a difference between what is the western portion of the fan and the um, eastern portion of the fan. And we interpret that as um, a, a period of time of significance to build progressively the fan. Uh, the, so we can, we can step away from the idea that it was a single burst of water that ran down the canyon and built it all in a day. It, it's, it's, there's too many things to point away from that. Um, we would anticipate uh, that it could be uh, easily thousands to millions of years, but this is what the importance of finding these grain sizes because we can start to calculate the transport, the water transport needed to move the gravel that then constrains the discharge of water. We can put the water in the channels. We can begin to calculate um, how much, um, how long that would take. So this is opening the door to a, um, to answer your question quantitatively. It's it's um, I'm comfortable to argue that it's certainly in the beyond the thousand times your time scale, but we, we're still gathering data to go further with that. I think it. I think we can now go further because of what we're seeing. Okay, do we have a question here in the front? And uh, then we'll go to a phone line right after you. Claudine Mullard, Le Monde, uh, you partially answered, but still I would like you, uh, either of you, to answer the controversy on the choice of the site. Some research that was recently revealed saying that the clays on Mars could not be due to water, but to magmatic um, precipitation. I'm sure you're aware of, of that research. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, the thing about curiosity is that we have the ability to, to detect clays uh, if we encounter them. And then what we're going to do is we'll study the context in which those clays occur and, and pick amongst the various options that are on the table. So right now, uh, we have no opinion. Uh, we haven't found any clays yet, but when we do, we're going to fit them within this context that you're hearing about today. Okay, we're going to go to the phone line and take Irene Klotz from Reuters. Hi, um, thanks very much. I have a couple of questions. First, I just wanted to clarify that the uh, this, this very interesting research you're reporting today, this was all based on um, imagery. There was no um, mineralogical or chemical analysis. Is that right? Uh, yeah, that's right, I, Irene. I, you know, the, the thing about it, in some cases, when you do geology, uh, you know, a, a picture's worth a thousand words. And in this case, the, the team felt uh, in discussing, really, this is just one of these cases where it's, it's kind of all about the images that brings you to this point. But the images only get you so far. You know, you look at the, at the rock that's still up on the screen there, and you wonder, why is it as hard as it is? That, for that, we really have to get into the chemistry and mineralogy, and that's the next step for us. Thanks. And uh, just to let you know, John, I was listening to you in Death Valley. Um, I understand that on Earth, uh, the tilting would come from plate tectonics. But what would account for the, 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 that break and the tilt on Mars? Yeah, so there's a couple of options. Uh, that, that's, that's a good question, and the science team is uh, actively discussing and debating what the options are. I think the simplest scenario is that somewhere near this, uh, this outcrop, uh, uh, a small impact occurred and just simply lifted the beds up and rotated them. But there are other options as well. Okay, we'll go next to uh, NPR, Joe Palka. Go ahead. Hello? Go ahead. Well, if you called on me, I can't hear myself or you, I'm afraid. 
Can you hear me now, Joe? Yeah. yeah okay, I can, go I ahead. I think I can. You can hear me, I take it. Yes. Um, two questions, then. Uh, one is, uh, do you have any idea how long ago this event took place? And the second is, uh, can you say anything about uh, how the rock became embedded with uh, water? I mean, I mean, sorry, how the rock, you said that there were pieces of rock embedded in rock, and I wondered how that process happens. Mike, why don't you take that? Okay, uh, let's see, the, what was the first part of it? How old is the oh. rock? <laughs> uh, we have no real way of estimating ages on Mars quantitatively. This is an old, these are old rocks. Uh, it is possible they were actually buried under the materials that the mound is now made out of, that the mound that we see now, that it, the mound has retreated to uncover these features. That's a possibility which would make them extremely ancient, or they may be somewhat younger, but probably uh, several billion years would be a, a, the canonical estimate by most scientists about how old things are of, in this region of Mars. Uh, how the rock, how we got the rock, basically what's happened as Bill described, you had water transporting these gravels down to the down slope to the bottom of uh, the uh, fan. At that point, they just stayed there. Other materials were deposited on top of them, uh, and eventually uh, they were cemented together by salts or by carbonates or some other material to act as a, as a means of, of holding the rock together. And then since then, they've been uncovered again, and that uncovering has revealed the, this resistant rock unit. But basically, it was gravel that was transported by water, uh, sat on the surface for a while, was then buried, and became lithified, turned into a rock thereafter. So it's a rock made out of other pieces of rock, and that's what we see at the surface today. Okay, thanks very much. Okay, next we're going to Craig Kovalt on the line. Go ahead, Craig. Craig Kovalt. Hi, this is uh, Craig Kovalt with uh, Space Ref and Aerospace America. Um, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you. Go ahead. Uh, a couple questions uh, relative to the alluvial fan down in the bottom of the crater there. What does it speak to relative to the what was going on above the crater rim? relative to water and the nature of water, uh, of course, via the imagery from MRO and the previous orbiters. And then I have a second follow-up. Um, okay, so the area that drains the head of that canyon is about 200 square miles or 500 square kilometers. We see traces of smaller tributary gullies in that area. So it suggests that there were concentrations of water um, that entered then the larger canyon that then did the cutting. The, how that, wh where the water come from and the mechanism of delivery is something we're exploring currently. Um, that water then ran down the canyon, um, though, and, and transported sediment across I, uh, a slope of just about 1%. It's a very gentle gradient fan um, and, and apparently continued down to where our landing site is. Okay, Maria. Second question is, um, pardon the pun, but given the Mars uh, exploration since Mariner 9 and the alluvial sand, really, um, is this really a watershed moment for the, <laughs> <laughs> for the Mars exploration program, given the history um, going back to Mariner 9 and all the orbiters and so. I, I think, Craig, it's, it sounds like you're scuba diving right now. I, I, I'm not sure we got all that. But if you're, if you're asking, you know, what, what is the profound uh, uh, significance of this discovery, I, I think the reason that we're, we're coming out with this as early as we are is, is because I, I, I would guess at this point in the history of exploration in the Mars program, we're getting better at, at being able to integrate the orbiter data with predictions about what things define on the surface. And so I think for a geologist to look from orbit and see an alluvial fan and then see a conglomerate rock that looks like it was transported in an alluvial fan is not rocket science. 
Um, but it is exactly the reason that we chose this landing site is because from orbit there are some signals that are very clear and you build your, your course of exploration built on those, those, those foundations that, that you think you're most likely to be able to establish. And, that, and I believe that's what we've done now. And so as we go forward now, we bring the rest of the payload in. We look at more rocks. We get more context. And the question about habitability goes just beyond the simple observation of, of water on Mars to recreating the environments in greater detail with an understanding of the chemistry that was going on at that time to ask if this is the kind of place that, that, that microorganisms could have lived. So certainly flowing water is a place where that could happen. And this particular kind of rock may or may not be a good place for us to preserve uh, those components that we associate with a habitable environment. So that's still to be determined, and uh, that's the research the team is working on. Thank you. Okay, the next caller is Randy Shostak with EOS Magazine. Go ahead. Randy Shostak with EOS Magazine. Okay, we're going to go to the next caller, and that would be Leo Enright with Irish Television. Go ahead, Leo. Thanks very much. Uh, I, a couple of questions, if I may. Uh, my first question, uh, this is a, obviously a stunning announcement, uh, and, uh, I mean, a, quite an extraordinary result of an early stage. Uh, and I'm not a geologist, I'm a journalist, so I'm asking you, why, why did it take you so long to make this announcement? I mean, it seems that any... Uh, you know, first-year geology student would have looked at that exposure and said immediately, uh, you know, that's water transport, uh, high speed, all of that. Uh, you know, was there somebody saying, hang on a minute, this could be something else, and if they were, what was that? Yeah, well, uh, so, well, Leo, thanks for that. Uh, uh, you know, I actually, it, it, it turns out that, that really there's some details here that matter uh, that, that, that may or may not be worth getting into. But, you know, there are options. And so, you know, the, the, the sort of the putting this in the context of a jackhammered urban sidewalk, actually, if you take concrete as a substance, it is not something that remains liquid because water is flowing freely across the surface and being vigorous. It, it's really, in a geological context, something called a debris flow. And, and I would say, you know, then you've got a more viscous material. And we are interested in the details of, of what, how the water expressed itself on the surface. And, and so we do keep in mind these alternative hypotheses as, as we look at this. And I think you have to look at this rock in a lot of detail and see it in a couple of places before you feel confident as, as a science team moving forward with a majority opinion that really this is more likely the result of water flowing vigorously across the surface rather than just sort of sluggishly pushing along in a, in, in a pile of watery debris. Uh, so the, to the extent that that makes a difference to you, that, that's a nuance that we were, we were interested to pursue. Uh, and my other question, uh, re my, my other question related to um, really the process of humans versus robots. Uh, uh, next tomorrow is researchers' night throughout Europe, uh, and in Ireland, uh, uh, as it happens, uh, in in two. Right. They'll be discussing the benefits, the, the possible benefits of astronauts versus uh, robots uh, in planetary exploration. So I wonder, did you have any thoughts uh, for, for that audience uh, as to, you know, having made this extraordinary uh, early uh, discovery, uh, does this tell you something about the, merit, the relative merits of humans versus robots? Well, uh, again, thank you for the heads up on that question by email. It allowed me to, to think it through a little bit. Uh, I, uh, you know, I, I think this is the kind of problem where this kind of rock, given the evidence we have from orbit, which is an analyzed by humans in advance of landing there, when, when we arrive at, at something like this with a robot, we can actually test the hypotheses, including the alternatives, pretty quickly and efficiently and arrive at a consensus opinion. A lot of people have asked, you know, what about this gigantic team and how does it come together? 
And I would say it's just simply an issue of signal to noise. If, if the geological signal of the process is large enough, it's very easy to build consensus, and that's what happened to our team. So for a robot, it's easy to, do, to achieve the data that you want to get. But let's say that this was a rock that we didn't expect at all, something that, that uh, provided no earthly analogs, something that wasn't easily to analyze. I think then if you're working with a robot and, and a very large team, it becomes very difficult to reach consensus. And therefore, there's no substitute really for a human when it comes to exploring really complex situations because the triage that you can do mentally as you, as you pass your judgment over the options and, and command yourself to walk to different places and make different measurements uh, is really the compelling reason to want to wanna do human exploration because it's just so much more efficient and you probably will arrive at conclusions that are more likely to be correct than if you had just a robot along. But we don't consider this to be a particularly complex scenario that we're looking at right now. Okay, we're going to the next reporter on the phone, and that would be Eric Hand from Nature. Go ahead. Okay, we're going to go then to the next person, and that would be Emily Lakdawalla from the Planetary Society. That was probably Eric. Oh, nope, that was Emily. Okay, we're going to keep going down. We have a lot. Um, Todd Halverson, Florida Today. Are you on the line? Sounds like the phone system went off. It does. Mm. Yeah. All right. Let me see if there's any questions here while we go um, try to find any callers. And I don't know Talk if there's some folks thoughts. over. Okay. <laughs> um, it, I want to go back to that question of habitats and habitability. Um, what do you think uh, this, you know, the, the finding that you have right now tells us about this site and uh, perhaps the, you know, implications for the larger site uh, around that where you're going to be heading in terms of Glen Elg. Uh, you said, I believe, that, that this is a potentially habitable place. Um, how, how significant is that in terms of the overall mission of Curiosity, which is to find habitable places? Uh, so that's that's a very uh, that's a very important uh, aspect of the mission. It, it's maybe the core of the mission is to explore for habitable environments. So again, just to remind you what a habitable environment is, it's one that has water, uh, sources of energy for the microorganisms to utilize for their metabolism, and then a source of carbon to build structures. So in that in that sort of flow, uh, that's what we're doing here, and and now we've got a hall pass for the, the water observation. And now we're gonna move on to the, the chemical building blocks of life and do the elemental chemistry and the mineralogy and see if everything adds up to the kind of scenario where there would be, you could reconstruct the, the kind of energy balances that might have occurred in this particular ancient environment. Then the last one is the most difficult of all, I, I believe, and something we've said uh, clearly all along. You know, finding evidence for preserved organic carbon is not easy on Earth, uh, on a planet that teems with life and has lots of water. You go back to rocks that are billions of years old, and what you discover is that the very process that, that enables life to be present, water, if you have too much of a good thing, it's a mild oxidant, and it actually results in, in redistribution of those large organic molecules into things like carbon dioxide that just drift away. So there's a part of this game that we refer to as preservation. And, and we look at a rock like this and wonder, okay, well, it might have been a habitable environment, but part of that is, is it the kind of thing that might preserve organic carbon? And if you have your choice between one kind of rock and another kind of rock, you know, we would look at this and this would be something that I think we would probably want to drill at some point and use the SAM instrument to inspect. But there might be other things that have a higher potential to have preserved organic carbon than this. So the point of the mapping that we're going to be doing as we go around is to look at these different kinds of rocks and assess their potential for preservation uh, and, then, and then try to rank those in terms of our priority. But this is just our first. So it, it would be a prospect, but maybe not at the top of our list. Okay, we're going to go back to the phone lines, and uh, Todd Halverson from Florida Today, you can go ahead. Uh, thanks very much, Todd Halverson of Florida Today. I guess for John, could um, you give us a general estimate uh, of when you expect to get to Glen Elg at this point, and 
I was wondering if you could kind of give us a sort of a real general idea on the go-forward plan from SOLS 52 and beyond. Right. So we've got uh, probably a couple SOLS ahead of us where we're looking at targets that uh, the rover uh, will want to, to scoop. Uh, our, our first step in, in putting materials into the SAM and Kemen instruments is to acquire a loose material. We have a, a requirement to do that. And we have a couple of nice targets that are within somewhere between two and three and four sols in front of us. And then when we get to that target, we'll park for what will seem like a very long time. It's going to take on the order of at least two weeks, maybe three weeks, because there's such a complex set of processes that we have to go through using the rover that have never been done before on Mars. And obviously, because it's what we call a first-time activity, we're going to be conservative, we're going to go slowly, we're going to make sure that everything is working in the sequence that it should. And then after that, we, we will proceed to the final Glen Elg destination, uh, where we'll look around and then begin to evaluate what our, our, our first candidate will be for drilling. Okay, we're going to go now to Ken Kramer from Spaceflight Magazine. Go ahead. Ken Kramer, you have to turn down your television. Let me ask you a question that came in from Emily Lakdawalla, if I can go ahead. Um, she said, uh, do conglomerate rocks present particular difficulties for drilling and sampling because of their heterogeneity? Geneity. Oh. <laughs> uh, that's, uh, that's another good question. This particular rock that we're looking at, one of the, yes, they do. Uh, this, we would consider this to be a challenging rock because the particles that make it up, you see that they weather out as discrete uh, bits of gravel, as, as Bill and Becky were, were, were showing. And the fact that they weather out and they retain their original shape so well suggests that it's, it's cemented, but probably not completely cemented. And so what we would worry about by drilling this rock is that maybe it would fragment and break along the boundaries between each one of these bits of gravel and, and we might not actually get much material up into the drill bit. So we're now, the project now, is looking at these kinds of rocks and collecting analogs from Earth to begin doing some testing with to make sure we're, we're ready to, to wrestle with something like this. Okay, and there's one more from Emily before I go to the phone line. This is when Twitter comes in handy, <laughs> when the phone doesn't work. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, are you chagrined at all that you didn't stop at Hata to investigate with Molly, or did MassCam 100 give you all you needed? Uh, well, that's uh, that's another that's an easier one. Uh, in that case, we we weren't really able to use the arm. We had to go through uh, Cap Two uh, in order to be able to use the arm, and that was so many weeks out into the future. Uh, we made the decision to to drive away, but now having seen these similar rocks in three different locations, we, we have confidence uh, that at some point we'll find another one that looks similar to this. And, and if not, then remember that the name Glenelg is a palindrome chosen by the team to represent that we're actually going to be passing by here again on the way out. Uh, so we can recover that if we need to. Okay, we're going to go back to the phone line and uh, Carl Franzen from Talking Point Memo, are you on the line? Hello, can you can you guys hear me all right? I can barely hear you. Okay, yes, we can hear you. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to, uh, following up on, uh, thank you again for uh, hosting this and uh, explaining everything uh, that you found so far. It's a really exciting uh, announcement. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. <laughs> Go ahead, yes. Yeah, you, okay. you might need to turn and, down your uh, Yeah, TV. so uh, uh, following up on an earlier question, uh, I just wanted to ask, I mean, is there any way that we'll be able to tell uh, either now or later on from uh, analysis of the, uh, the rock and soil samples, uh, w whether or not there was anything uh, living in this water, whether that was on the stream bed itself or flowing through the stream, and, and uh, you know, or, or, or is that uh, not uh, even in the cards here, or, or, or is that a possibility, I guess? Uh, it's certainly a possibility that we can try to look, uh, and to be brief as possible, this just requires us to sample the rock, uh, collect uh, uh, some portion of it, 
and be able to look for uh, organic carbon, which is one of the objectives of the mission. And if we find it, that in its own right does not require that, that there was ever uh, uh, living microorganisms here. There are lots of other ways that organic carbon can be introduced to the to the surface of, uh, the, the, of Mars by inorganic processes. And one of the great things about uh, uh, a river system like this is that it, it, it could potentially collect those materials from much farther away than the rover is and bring them right to us. And uh, so, you know, this is definitely something that if we can, uh, we would like to drill at some point and, and do that exploration. But, but you said the carbon could be from, uh, you know, like you said, a variety of sources. So is there any, is there any way to decisively know, based on studying it using any of the instruments, uh, whether or not it came from a living, uh, a, a living uh, you know, organism? Argu or arguments like that are based on a preponderance of evidence. And when we, we, we take that, uh, that argument to the earth uh, and go back to rocks that are billions of years old, we require multiple lines of evidence. And Curiosity has the ability to detect organic carbons and, and actually tear them apart in some detail. Uh, but it's going to have to wait to another mission to, to be able to definitively uh, demonstrate that. Okay. Thank you. Helpful. All right. We're going to take our last question from the phone line now, and that would be uh, Ken Kramer from Spaceflight Magazine. Go ahead. Okay, no, Ken has dropped off the line. All right, we're going to wrap it up then here. Ken, just go ahead and contact us another way, and we'll get your question to the panel. Um, and uh, I just want to encourage everyone to continue to follow this mission. We post uh, updates daily, and we have plenty of videos that go along with the mission each week posted on Thursdays. You can find everything at nasa.gov slash MSL. So just continue to follow us and join us with the uh, journey of curiosity. Thank you so much.